Good morning and welcome to Emmanuel Church this morning. It is great to welcome you, whether you're watching at home, whether you're watching online, whether you're watching on DVD, or if you're in the building. Uh, last Sunday was our first Sunday back in the building, uh, and Andrew Griffiths uh, took a photo or two of us back in the building, and this is what it looked like. Great God of highest heaven, occupy my life. Now you may have noticed uh, in that that some people were standing, some people were sitting. That's because at the beginning I said um, for the songs, um, people could stand or sit, they could choose whatever they wanted to do. And so some stood and some sat. Uh, but the thing we weren't allowed to do was to sing together, which actually was surprisingly difficult because being there with everyone else uh, who was in the building, you just wanted to sing. But it was good uh, being back together. Now, uh, some people want, will want to keep uh, watching these services and joining in online, and that's fine. If you want to come back to being in the building and seeing the online service shown in the building, we need you to register. We need you to do this every week for the service if you're going to be in the building. So uh, after this, get onto the website if you want to. You can get to the registration that way to register to come next week if you'd like to. Uh, or you can phone the church office and let us know that way. Now, we mentioned uh, another thing last week called Church Suite. Uh, and we want to encourage everyone in the church family, if you're able to, to log into Church Suite and put in your details there. We're going to be starting to use it and use it more and more in due course for a whole load of things like routers and communication and that sort of thing. Now, if you're not on the internet, we'll keep communicating with you in the usual way. But if you are able to get onto it, uh, please do log into Church Suite and fill in your details. Now, as usual, as we go through the service, click on notes, you'll see the order of service there, and you'll also see the sermon notes that you can follow through when I'm preaching. Uh, if you'd like prayer, then please click on live prayer and there'll be someone ready to pray for you. Or you can use the email at the top of notes. We're going to, in a few moments, have our first song. Now, we did this one a couple of weeks ago. It's a memory verse, actually. It's the verse from Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. And in the version that they use, it says this. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Well, there are lots of wonderful truths in those verses. So let's begin our service by praying together. Heavenly Father, we praise you that though we were dead in our sins and transgressions, yet you have made us alive through the Lord Jesus Christ, that those who come to him, those who trust in him, have had all their sins washed away and have been given life, life which starts now and lasts for all eternity. Father, we praise you that you save, not because of us, not because of our good deeds, but because of your grace, because of your mercy and your great love for us. And therefore, Father, throughout this service, move us in our hearts to praise you and thank you and help us to be ready to listen to you and to obey you. Amen. We're going to have that first song now. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses,
she loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses. So children, you're now about to head out to Jam, uh, to your Jam Zoom group, but let's pray together first before you go. So uh, sit back down and uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray please that you would be our teacher now, whether we're staying in the uh, online service or whether we're going to the Jam Zoom group. Father, please teach us. We need you to help us by your spirit open our eyes and our ears to understand your word and help us to know how we can live it out day by day. Amen. Okay, children, uh, you can head to your Jam Zoom group now. Uh, and for everyone else, well, uh, we were reminded at the start of the service in those verses in Ephesians that we can't save ourselves. That's part of the point of those verses, that we're dead in transgressions and sins, and dead people can't save themselves, they can't do anything. And we need God to be the one who rescues us, who saves us, who gives us life. Uh, and that's what our next song is about. So we're going to sing, You Alone Can Rescue.
And now Paul and Yasmin are going to lead us in our prayers, uh, and then they'll read our Bible reading for us. Let us begin our time of prayer with a confession. God, our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sin, for turning away from you and ignoring your commandments. Father, we are sorry. For behaving just as we wish without thinking of you. Father, we are sorry. For failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, we are sorry. For failing to love others through selfishness, greed, and apathy. Father, we are sorry. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, we are reminded how we have been forgiven. It says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. We thank you, Father, that through Jesus we have this forgiveness. Amen. We now continue our time of prayer. Father, we pray for those affected by the coronavirus, in particular those in India where they lead the world in new caseloads. We pray that you give the government wisdom to keep this pandemic under control for the sake of the people you have put under their care to govern. More locally, Father, we continue to pray for Peter Holmes' family. We pray that you continue to comfort them as they grieve Peter's death. And as they grieve, they grieve knowing Jesus died and rose again. And because of this, God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him on the last day. We thank you that because Jesus lives, Peter also will live. We pray for Grace Church New Malden, Father. They're looking for a pastor to lead this church planting initiative. We pray you would give those who are responsible for appointing this pastor wisdom in their decision making. That they would look carefully at the criteria you have stated in your word and let it be the lens through which they make this appointment. Father, we pray for those in our church who are grieving the loss of a church brother or sister, a family member, a spouse, and for those who are struggling with their faith right now. We bring these individuals silently to you now. Let us finish our time of prayer with the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our reading today is from 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 13. If you have a Bible, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 13. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as example to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in reverie. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 of them died. You should not test Christ, 
as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please keep that passage open in front of you, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 13. And I'm going to begin by praying for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, as the psalmist says, uh, would your word be uh, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path? Amen. Well, next week, and for the autumn term, we are going to be doing a new sermon series. We're going to be getting into the book of Amos. Now, Amos was a book in the Old Testament written in the 8th century BC. So that's about 2,800 years ago. And it is a book of warnings to the people of Israel of coming judgment. Now, it may just be that in introducing the book like that, uh, there are some who aren't totally excited about uh, reading the book of Amos. We do have a bit of a problem, don't we, and some more than others, um, when it comes to thinking about the Old Testament, because we can feel it just isn't relevant to us. It's so old. It's such a long time ago. I mean, 2,800 years ago. That's a long time ago. I mean, that's I mean, it even feels like 50 years ago was quite a long time ago. I mean, you didn't have internet then. Um, and so 2,800 years ago, well, life would have been so different. It feels irrelevant. And, uh, and actually, it can feel irrelevant from a faith point of view as well, can't it? Because, well, that's Old Testament and we're New Testament believers. Jesus has come and lived and died and risen and ascended. And therefore, we're just in a different place. So it just feels Old Testament is old and, well, irrelevant. It can feel a bit like maybe your loft in your house. Uh, that you don't go there very often. Uh, once a year, maybe you'll bring down verses from, you know, from the Old Testament about uh, a child being born to you. And uh, so you'll bring those down at Christmas time. But the rest of the time, you, you kind of don't go up there very much. And you're not totally sure what's there. And in some areas, you're not sure you want to know what's there. Uh, and, well, that's how the Old Testament can feel. And if the Old Testament feels like that, then the prophets, of which Amos is one, can feel like a dusty old box, which has been handed down from generation to generation, which is just in some pokey corner within the loft, that you think, well, I'm not sure there's much point in getting that down. Well... We need to change the way we think. And uh, 1 Corinthians 10 is a great place to look because here Paul teaches the Corinthians. He's trying to teach them how they, what they should believe, what, how they should live. There are all kinds of problems in the church in Corinth. And he takes them back to the Old Testament. Now, actually, he takes them back to the Exodus to look at that. But what he says about those Old Testament uh, stories in the Exodus uh, are also true for the book of Amos. Uh, that we're going to be looking at. And so we're going to look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 10 to help us as we sort of tee up for this sermon series in Amos. And I hope by the end of this morning's sermon, you'll be feeling actually this is a box that shouldn't stay in the loft. It should be when we get down, dust off, open up and read. And so the first thing that I want you to see from this passage in 1 Corinthians 10 is that Paul says that the Old Testament was written for you. You see, that's what Paul wanted the Corinthians to see, that these Old Testament passages were written for them. And so he says, verse 6, have a look, now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Or look down at verse 11, it says, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us 
on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Now that's really significant. Paul's saying those Old Testament passages, those passages in Exodus, but actually the whole of the Old Testament was written down for us. Yes, it was written down for the original hearers, the original readers, and so it was written down for Old Testament Israel, but actually Paul's saying something quite significant here. He's saying to the Corinthians, when you think about those Old Testament passages, don't just think about them as being history. And actually, the, the church in Corinth wasn't predominantly Jewish. There, there, there were, there were non-Jews in there. He's saying, look, when you think about those passages, don't think of them as just being about, oh, Israel's history, they are irrelevant to us. No, he's saying when God had them written down, he had them written down for you. And that's true for us as well. The, the book of Amos that we're going to come to, God had it written down for you and me. Now that's really significant, isn't it? If you were to go up into the loft and you found in the corner a, an old dusty box handed down generation to generation, but you read on a label that it was for you, maybe it says for Bart on there, or for Emmanuel Church Tolworth, or for your name, and you were to bring it down, you would go, actually, I am now really interested in this. Because God's written the book of Amos for you and me, and therefore we must read it. And then in the passage, Paul brings out at least two similarities between us and the Old Testament uh, people of God and one big difference. So we're going to think about them. And the first similarity is that our temptations are the same. Now, actually, Paul is saying that uh, the Corinthians, the Corinthian Christians, have a lot in common with Old Testament uh, people of God uh, and particularly he was taking them back to the people of the Exodus. Now we need to know a little bit about the history there. So God rescued a people out of slavery in Egypt, his people, the Israelites. He rescued them, he brought them out of Egypt and took them through the Red Sea uh, and brought them through the wilderness where he provided for them. He provided food and drink for them and brought them to the promised land. But uh, in the meantime, after he'd rescued them and before they got to the promised land, they grumbled and they sinned and they rebelled against God in lots of different ways. And Paul's saying, look, you Corinthians, you're very like them. Actually, he brings out, there's a bit of a parallel between what they went through in going through the sea and the baptism that Christians have. That's what he seems to be saying, doesn't it? In verse 2, they were all baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And there seems to be a parallel with communion almost. Verse 3, they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. And so there's another parallel, you see, that, that they had Christ with them. You know, maybe you don't think of Christ as being there in the Old Testament, but he was. He was with them. And if they trusted in God, they were trusting in Christ. And so Paul's saying, actually, it's not that different from us. But here's a big thing. Even though they had all those things, verse 5, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Why? What happened? Well, they rebelled against God. And Paul goes through the things that they were tempted to do, and he's saying, actually, you Corinthians, you're likely to do the same if you're not careful. Notice how many times he says uh, not to be like them. Don't be as they were. Don't do as they did. So verse 6, now these things has occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. Verse 8, we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. Verse 9, we should not test the Lord, as some of them did. Verse 10, and do not grumble, as some of them did. In other words, Paul's saying, look, when you read about the Exodus and you read about that generation who came out of Egypt and rebelled against God, don't just think, well, they were stupid, weren't they? Don't just think, well, I wouldn't do that. He's saying, no, they are an example to you and me because we'll be tempted to do exactly the same things. Even though they were thousands of years ago. The human condition hasn't changed. Because the Bible says the human condition is universal and it is what the Bible calls sin. 
And wherever you are in the history of the world, and wherever you are throughout the world, whatever race, whatever nation you're from, whatever ethnicity, whatever skin colour, whatever it may be, our condition is the same. We are still sinners and we will be tempted in the same ways as the Old Testament people of God were. And that's true with Amos as well. You see, as we read the book of Amos, we're reading a book where God is judging people. He's saying, I'm going to bring judgment on you because you've rebelled against me. And as we read the book of Amos, we can see ourselves in it. Uh, Some years back, uh, we found a a photograph in our family of uh, my grandfather. Uh, My grandfather on my father's side, who who I never knew. Uh, But we saw a picture of him. And as people looked at that picture, as my family looked at that picture, they said, Bart looks just like him. As we look at the book of Amos, though it's 2,800 years ago that it was written, we look at it and we see ourselves because our hearts are still the same. We're still sinners. Now, that's not the only similarity. Yes, we're tempted the same way that they were. Our temptations are similar. But God is the same as well. Not only are we the same, but God is the same. He's still hates sin and the things he hated in the old testament he still hates today Uh, and we see that that's why there's this warning in 1 corinthians 10. so verse 5 it says nevertheless god was not pleased with most of them that's the israelites who rebelled against god their bodies were scattered over the desert and then verse 11, we've already seen this verse, but verse 11, these things happened as examples and were written down as warnings for us. In other words, God is still the same. It wouldn't be a warning if God had changed. God's still the same. He still hates sin. In the book of Amos, we'll find right at the beginning of the book, God is described as a roaring lion. Is that how you think of God? I think we have a danger today, don't we, of thinking of God as being sort of domesticated, that he's he's more of a, a, a cuddly little cat. He is not. He is a roaring lion. And the things that made him roar in Amos still make him roar today. He still hates them. And notice, this was written to Christians, these, this 1 Corinthians passage. He's, Paul is saying, look, this is a warning for you Christians that God still hates what he hated back then. Now, you might say, surely God wouldn't do that. God wouldn't judge us, would he? He wouldn't judge people today. That feels a bit Old Testament, doesn't it? You look through the New Testament, though, and you will see God does judge. Just look in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 5. Read up about Ananias and Sapphira. They lied to God and withheld money that they'd said that they had given, and God struck them down. Or go to the book of Revelation, and you see at the beginning, letters to seven churches, the first one of which, God says if they don't change, and what they'd lost was their love, their love for God. God says, if you don't change, I'm going to remove your lampstand from its place. In other words, I'm going to judge you, and that will be the end of that church. You see, God is still a God of judgment, who still roars, and who still hates sin. Now, you might say, well, I'm saved by grace, aren't I? And uh, we thought about this earlier in the service. That means uh, I'm, it's not about me. It's not about my works. I'm a sinner. God needs to rescue me. I'm saved by grace. It's not about me. And therefore, it doesn't matter what I do. Well, you see, that's almost right, isn't it? Yes, we are sinners and we need God to rescue us. But it does matter what we do. It does matter how we live. And one of the shocks that we will get in the book of Amos is that God will confront us with a Christianity uh, which is insipid, which is just about ritual, which is just about the presentation of things, but actually doesn't have any impact on our lives. And God will say, actually, if that's you, you need to be warned that if your Christianity is all show and doesn't impact your life, doesn't change you, then you're in big danger then you will face a roaring lion. God still hates the things he's always hated. But there's one big difference, and that is the fulfilment of the ages. 
And this is a big difference, even though Paul sums it up uh, in just a few words. He says, verse 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. He says, all of history has been building up to one moment, to one thing that was going to happen, and it has now happened. He says, the Old Testament was pointing forward to this, and we've seen it. It's a bit like if you were to go to that box from the loft and were to take out a picture and you saw there a photograph of uh, the house that you're living in being built. And there is a member of our church family who can do this. Barbara Knight, I think she's got a photo of her house being built and her father being one of the people building it. And if you were to look at that photo, you could see the house under construction and then you could look around and you could see actually the house has been built. And so too with the Old Testament, as we read it, we see it's all pointing us forward to something that was going to happen. And that thing that was to happen was the life, death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus. And that has now happened. And so as we read the Old Testament, as we read Amos, we need to see it's all pointing to him. And we need to keep asking, how does Amos point us to Jesus? Because you see, it's all one big story. See, there's, there's a page in the Bible that you could legitimately rip out. Only one page. And that's the page that they've put in, which is a blank page between the Old Testament and the New Testament. For some reason, uh, editors and, and people who make Bibles put a page in there. But it shouldn't be there because it suggests that you've got the Old Testament, which is one story, and the New Testament, which is another. But it isn't. It's all one big story, all pointing to Jesus. So, as we get into Amos, we need to keep asking, how is this book pointing us to Jesus? And we'll see, uh, as we see our sin in the people of Israel, so we see uh, that we need to be driven to Jesus for forgiveness. We need to be washed clean by Jesus. That's what he came to do. And we need Jesus to fill us by his spirit to enable us to be able to live godly lives. You see, as we come to the book of Amos, we're not just to read it and think, right, we've got to do better than the Israelites. We've got to try harder. We've got to succeed where they failed. No, we need to look to Jesus and see him as the one who succeeded where we fail. Him as the one who can forgive us our sin, but also him as the one who can enable us to live for him. And how does he do that? by taking us back to the gospel of grace. It is the gospel of his grace which equips us to live godly lives. And that's what we need. So I hope uh, that in looking at this passage, it has encouraged you to dig into the book of Amos, to get it down from the loft, dust it off, open it up and have a read. It was written for you. Yeah, we'll see our sin in there. We'll see our own hearts in there. And we'll see what God loves and what God hates. And it will drive us to the Lord Jesus for forgiveness and to ask him to equip us to live for him. So how about having a read of it this week? Uh, have a read through. It won't take you long to read through the whole of the book of Amos. And next week, we'll dig into the first few verses of the first chapter. I'm going to lead us in prayer. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the whole Bible. Uh, we thank you that it is all written for us. And so help us, Father, to read it. Help us, Father, uh, uh, to see our own sin as we see your rebellious people in the Old Testament. And Father, help us to know you better, to know what you love and what you hate. And drive us, we pray, to the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness that he achieved on the cross. And Father, by your Spirit, would you fill us that to equip us to live godly lives for you. Help us to understand the gospel of grace better and better that we would be equipped to live lives for you day by day. Amen. In the light of what we've just read, we're going to sing our last song, By Faith We See the Hand of God.
Thank you for being with us this morning for our service. Uh, I'm going to finish our, our service with a prayer from the book of Colossians. Uh, and then after that, do join in the chat online. Uh, or if you're in the church building, then, as last week, await further instructions. Just stay where you are for the moment. Uh, like we said before, if you'd like to be in the building next week, um, please register online. And uh, as we said, please do also log into Church Suite and uh, fill out your details there if you're able to. So a final prayer from Colossians. Oh God, please fill us today with the knowledge of your will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we may live a life worthy of you and may please you in every way. Help us bear fruit in every good work and grow in our knowledge of you. And please strengthen us with all power according to your glorious might so that we may have great endurance and patience and may joyfully give thanks. For you have rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.